Welcome to the You Big Talker Talk Show. I'm your host, Eleni. You Big Talker 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 Talk I wanted to thank our new subscribers, Jill and Dillip, and perhaps a couple of anonymous people. I also wanted to thank Courtney, Caitlin, Laura, and Dillip for your comments, and also my good friend Bonnie for weighing in on the show. We have a great show for you today. I'm really excited about it. I have a sketch showing you the top ways I am attempting to avoid Alzheimer's. Lots of cool stuff. Topical issues, obviously, because we've just come through an election. An interview with a fantastic activist, Rachel Bjork. And of course, we have renovations from Robbie. Now we're in our topical and eternal section. Whew, the election. What a roller coaster ride. There was a lot of page refreshing a lot of data depletion. I looked a lot at this map, willing it to change. Um, so when I did finally read the election results on Tuesday morning, I was so elated, I just started crying. I was just curious how our current president would, would handle the news. I looked at a few of his tweets and it seems that they're all being flagged at least around the time of the election. And I, I just kind of love how the narrative of what it's saying under each tweet. So it's kind of nice that the, the news media and social media is doing a little bit better of a job of actually flagging things that are not correct. Counting ballots. Um, <laughs> who knew that would be so contentious to actually count votes? I guess you can make anything up you want. And if you want to believe it, you will believe it. If you're in the cult, you're gonna believe it. And that's the nature of a cult. Your leader can do, you know, racist things. Your leader can be a fascist. But because there's one thing you believe in about that leader, there's something you relate to or identify with, it's hard to see those bad things. So I do consider it a cult. And Rob Beloved has joined us. Hey, everybody. I, I don't want to alienate people, but of course calling it a cult is certainly not a bridge that I'm building. I tend to think that cutting each other off also cuts off curiosity and compassion. It can only help to understand and um, talk together and ask questions, but it's super hard when it's your family. <laughs> Some things you, you know, you can't correct. It's like a lot of people voted for Trump. Uh, a lot of people either believe in a lot of conspiracy stuff. Look, I'm wearing a little red and, a little, and blue. I feel like I'm mostly blue, you know, but I have compassion for the little red. <laughs> That's why my lipstick's red. You cut off your family or how do you handle your relationships where you have those who don't believe as you do? What has been effective for you? Are we more than our political parties as Zadie Smith suggested and I mentioned in the first episode. In other news, celebration was fun. I went to the march during the day. This is what democracy looks like. Democracy, democracy looks like. A couple friends sent me articles about Philly and why you don't mess with Philly and it has to do partially with gritty but partially history of I guess throwing things at Santa Claus who does that. Apparently some people, Batteries. <laughs> some people in Philly do. Maybe Santa needed some energy. There was also something in the articles about greasing poles so people wouldn't climb on them which I had no idea about that since I haven't tried to climb a pole in Philly. Well there was one time we were in an Italian market and I'm like why is there grease all over these lampposts? <laughs> I had no idea. Now I know. I have a picture here from a man who climbed the pole and it was it was a little anticlimactic. He was climbing the pole. It was very exciting. Everybody was looking. Kind of waited for something to happen either you know hoping he wouldn't fall he ended up just swinging and then I wasn't sure what the finale was there wasn't one the other thing that really struck me is I saw this video from Van Jones when he found out the news and just how emotional he was about Biden being elected and just but a lot of people also said that being a good person matters being um, kind to other people matters I love that uh, the press conference for Trump was going to be at the Four Seasons he thought but it was actually Four Seasons landscaping but it looks like they have a sense of humor too yeah. I have this photo here of gritty uh, an aluminum hat and conspiracy theories it's pretty funny the stock markets are up after news of the election but also news of a vaccine people who didn't vote for Biden I hope you just take the time to just like kind of research his background. And he's apologized for the crime bill support and things like that. He's apologized for how he treated Anita Hill. I do believe in uh, Biden and Harris. And of course, as everyone says, we have work to do. We have a sketch for you today based on how to prevent Alzheimer's. My Nana had Alzheimer's and that's my grandmother. I've of course always been fearful of getting that myself. I've come up with a few ways based on science how I can prevent Alzheimer's. My husband has assured me that if I befall this fate. He will watch closely after me. Basically, I would disconnect the internet from her computer and let her type away on projects that she thinks she's working on because she's always working on projects. Hi, doll. How's it going? Oh, I'm 
just working. Wow, you're doing a great job. Thank you. When's the book coming out? Soon. Yeah, I'll check in with you later and get your little lunch ready for you. Oh, did I tell you I'm vegan? Yeah, honey, we've been vegan for a long time now. Oh, good. 60 years. Wasn't well, that nice? Hey, are we the band? Yeah. You play drums and sing. Ooh. Do you remember the name of the band? Yeah, it's a, it's a funny one. Yeah, it's all, it starts with the letter B. Oh, Beatles. Beatles. Uh, no, honey. We're nothing. big. Okay. Oh. Number one, blood pressure control. So first I have to control my blood pressure. And as I've told Rob, he can't stress me out at all. So sometimes he'll stress me out. Hey, what are you doing? I'm getting stressed out. <laughs> the other thing I know that you're supposed to try is sort of like cognitive training. So, um, four. Okay. Okay, I go first. I win! It's really important to get a lot of physical activity. So I make sure I do this daily. One. Squat. Two, five, six. I get to eat it. Next, I have heard that it's very important to have good oral hygiene per an article my friend Lynn sent me. I became very attentive to these details following that news. Oh, oh deodorant. Hello, gentle dental? Yeah, I'd like to make an appointment. Can I actually switch out my teeth? There is some connection, possibly, between the amount of strength you have in your calf muscles and getting Alzheimer's or not. So it made me think about how there's some connection between exercise and then dancing and yoga and ballet. And I definitely make sure to get plenty of tiptoes in. The other key to avoiding Alzheimer's success, I've been told actually by, this is the person who told me, is uh, drinking, no, not drinking, <laughs> big mistake, breathing, oxygen. So somehow, the oxygen to your brain it helps. I don't know if this is true, but it doesn't hurt to take deep breaths anyway. It's kind of meditative. The last tip is around plaque, which I think is related to the teeth, but maybe also brain plaque. I don't get near plaques. Okay. Yeah, there's no plaques in my room. It looks like there were a few prevention strategies that I forgot. Uh oh. After a good night's sleep, I remembered them. Whoa! <laughs> I can't sleep. These are too heavy on my eyes. Is that bad for the eyes? Count sheep. No, because then I think about all the suffering of the sheep. So tell me a story. Think about the monkey king in the jungle. And how Did you know monkeys were found to be enslaved to make that coconut milk? By Chawa. Oh, that's horrible. I guess I'll just watch some more Seinfeld. Chemicals. So how do you protect yourself from chemicals? The mask. How do you protect your skin? You mean from chemical burns? I, I, I stay away from meth labs. <laughs> I hope you like that sketch. Uh, you know, I really hope that dropping things is no indication of uh, future Alzheimer's. <laughs> now we are going in cool stuff. So if you're tired of the elections, I'd recommend you refresh your PBS um, browser. That made no sense. Anyway, go to PBS. We went and watched a show on Nova about an asteroid. And they were able to do mathematically figure everything out and land it. And pull samples out. Yeah. You know, if I built that rocket, it would be like a book flying into space because I my degree was in English literature. But the other thing that's cool that I really enjoyed, especially during the tension of this election, is 
Instagram Live with Be Nice. As he says, good vibes. And on election day, he was spinning for over 14 hours. His whole reason was he wanted to entertain people while they were stuck in lines. Also, we got new hoodies. Bad things happen in Philadelphia. I've been listening to Miles Davis, Bitches Brew. Had never listened to that in entirety. It was irritating Rob a little bit the other day because it's, it's a little... A lot of horns Experimental, going on, yeah, <laughs> but I liked it. I uh, also wanted to recommend a friend of mine, Bonnie, who had mentioned earlier. She uh, subscribes to a channel called How to Cook That, and she's an excellent baker. I really think she should open a show called Bonnie's Bakery and look at how to make really elaborate things like a Minecraft cake or just crazy things you'll see in the pictures. And I put a link to the her vegan cake recipe, a chocolate cake. And our next section is it's just food. There's been a long trial, even longer than maybe O.J. Simpson, on soy. People hear the word and they, I don't know, they equate it with something they, they've That's heard. Yeah, they've <laughs> heard something soy bad. 88% of the soy grown is to feed animals. So in any case, soy, I would, after this long trial, was recently acquitted. As it stands, there is no convincing evidence that eating soy increases the risk of breast cancer in humans. And so that was one thing that um, I think a dairy funded group called Weston Price was um, alleging and kind of like what Trump does with the media and talking about voter fraud and things like that. People believed it. And so the misunderstanding, they say, stems from earlier studies in rodents. However, humans process soy differently than rodents. It happens a lot where people do these tests in animals and then they don't apply. We're, we're different. You know, we both suffer. <laughs> That's common. But how are bodies behave and react is different. This study searched for associations between soy, dairy intake, and breast cancer risk. Basically, the scientists followed 52,795 cancer-free women in the U.S. for just about eight years. Not only did they find no clear association between soy intake and breast cancer, but they did identify a link between dairy milk and breast cancer. <laughs> McDonald's is testing a new uh, veggie burger called the McPlant in several markets. What do you think of the name? I think it's great. Thumbs you up like here. McPlant? McPlant, yeah, because honestly, they're, you know, that's... It, it makes me think of a weed in between a couple buns, really? like like a piece, like a plant, or maybe a spider plant, or... Well, I mean, if they want to keep up with Burger King... What would you call it? The McVeg? Instead of the Big Mac, would you call it the Big Don? But that might be too close to the president's name. <laughs> Weigh in on the comments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there was an article in Farmers Weekly. Um, he tried a burger, was embarrassed to buy this burger, and he equated it to buying a condom when he was younger. People are strange. Right? And, and then he said, as livestock farmers, fake meats made in factories may seem like something out of a bleakly dark and dystopian future. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, let's compare. Like, cows, here's the cows. Mm. Most cows is where they come from. And now it's the plant meat. Okay. But then he says they're perfectly normal to the younger generation who are increasingly climate aware. In other news, there was an article, uh, the author Jason Hill said, we can eat better, healthier foods. But the problem with that is, what does it mean to eat better? How can people quantify that day to day? Like you go to the store, I'm gonna eat better. So that's hard to measure rather than I'm just gonna eat something plant-based because I know growing this is less environmentally intensive. So, but he did conclude that a nearly complete switch to a plant-based diet around the world um, would slash 720 billion tons of greenhouse gases. Well, what I'm wondering in this report, which I, again, I'll link, is where is the information about, you know, if you actually eat identical products that are made from plants instead of meat because you're using what we know about science. In fact, um, the University of Michigan's Center for Sustainable Systems put the Beyond Burger, it's a burger made from plants, through a life cycle analysis, and it compared it with the production of a traditional beef burger. And what they found was, guess? 90% fewer greenhouse gases were emitted. Than a quarter pound of US beef. I'd like to introduce my friend Rachel Bjork, who lives in Seattle, works full time, is a full time activist for animals and social justice causes. It's not just animals, but people too. I met her in 2002 when Rob and I first joined NARN, mm -hmm. the Northwest Animal Rights Network. So I hope you enjoy it. Rachel Bjork, welcome. 2002 is when I got involved with NARN, and then I heard some things at your meetings about dairy and the connection between veal. But the other thing that pushed me was I realized that the people in NARN were actually fun people. You like to have a drink occasionally, not that you have to have a drink to have fun, but that's... <laughs> 
helped me at least um, realize that vegans weren't weirdos. How long have you been a vegan or a vegan activist? For 20 years. It was that community connection that, that made me be a committed vegan and, and I never looked back. When I first knew you, within the first year or so, I think you made that decision to bicycle all the way across the country to protest the way KFC treats their chickens. That was a great trip. I still love the interview you did with me about that. I mean, I like riding my bike and I also got to meet a lot of really interesting people. It wasn't about not killing chickens at all. It was just kill them nicer. I realized that that kind of campaign allows you to have all these conversations with people. You're not asking them to go vegan. You're just, you're, you're asking them to consider why it matters that you treat this chicken nicer. And then they start thinking about, well, that chicken has value. At its core, it's about justice. Like we don't want to be treating these animals this way because it's just not right. And we, I don't want to trash the environment because it's just not right. The Black Lives Matter, it's, that's ultimately about treating other human beings fairly. And we're trying to work towards equity and all these other things that I'm interested in at their core, they're about justice. Like we have to be consistent in our compassion, kind of not eating animals is the least we can do, but there's plenty of other things that we do that cause harm. And what would you tell somebody who's interested in trying a, a plant-based diet? I think we get into mistakes sometimes of, of talking about what we want to talk about instead of trying to figure out what your audience is interested in. And I was gradual vegetarian, gradual vegan, because people get caught up in this, oh my God, I have to like throw everything in my cabinet. Well, no. It's also true, I think, of our political discussions, because that's so divisive. People aren't just their political uh, affiliations, they're humans under, underneath that. So if somebody's looking to get in, get active for animals, what, what would you say is something that they could pursue or try? It does help to kind of have a focus because the more you know about a particular issue, the better you can get at it and you'll be less scattershot. And even just like letters to the editor really matter and writing comments. So a lot of times we think like, oh, I'm going to submit a comment and it doesn't matter. Well, it actually really does matter. And writing to your, your representative. I mean, I write to my representatives all the time. <laughs> There's so many bills that come before them during a session, they don't have time to get educated, so they listen to their constituents. You know, talking to your local restaurant about having more vegan options. They'll, they'll change things just based on a couple re requests. It's not like a scientific experiment where they have to have, you know, 100 people in a control group. You do make the effort and you're kind about it. I think that's, that's good. Um, one of the things that really impresses me, one, is that you pretty much bike everywhere, um, except for with the Alto, which we'll talk about later. And how many miles is it to your work, first of all? 20. <gasps> yeah. To me, I, that would be like a once a, every six months, I'd, I'd take a 20 mile bike ride. And second is that once every month, I think you go to these oversight committees for the UW animal experimentation. They are supposed to be reviewing the experiments that are done on, on animals that are covered by the Animal Welfare Act. Mice and rats are not covered by the Animal Welfare Act. Now the, the meetings are basically, they'll talk about non-compliance issues. Like in this last meeting, they found out that somebody they clipped the tail off the mice and they do that to get a DNA sample when they were older than they were supposed to be. They did that without anesthetic, right? Correct. Yeah, it hurts. And then one of them, they, it was done so poorly that there was some bone showing. So they report things like that. One experiment, they brought that before the full committee because they were doing a category E and meaning that they were inflicting pain on the animal without any kind of pain relief. And they were doing this study on young ferrets and they would give them a measured blow to the head, but they basically purposely gave them brain damage, like, you know, crushing their skull. And they would do this on a particular intervals and they were testing how well they could get through a maze. And it was a water maze, by the way. And then after they smash their skull, they have them do it again. And then they keep going and seeing basically how much brain damage, how it affected their behavior. They ended it early because they figured out that the ferrets weren't very good models. I mean, when human beings get head trauma, football players and rugby players and all these players, they're actually really willing to have be studied and you don't have to give them drugs if you're just having them you know do this behavioral stuff. It's, do you think it's a matter of that the incentive is there to be funded and you need to publish and to get your name out there in academia? I think that's part of it and also there's curiosity on the part of the researchers so they're like well they have this hypothesis like well I wonder what will happen if we do x. What's right, going to happen? And so, right, like a kid who wants to pull off the legs of a, an insect or something yeah. just to see what happens. I, I don't think they're sadistic. I think they see the animals as tools. There's another guy that takes pigs and he gives them 
heart attacks. And then he treats them with stem cells. So he's trying to see if stem cells are going to repair the damaged heart. And so in his mind, probably, I'm trying to be charitable about it, he, he would be able to help human beings that have heart attacks. There's no real proof that any of these animal experiments have saved a human life. And I think, honestly, that we have done ourselves a disservice. I mean, we've, we've been experimenting on monkeys since the 90s, really, to try and find a cure for HIV. And then you're taking these animals that can't get HIV. They get a simian version of it, but it's not HIV. How much further would we have been if we had done more careful research? I'm not talking about, well, now we're going to go round up a bunch of people and do the testing on them. It's that we have alternatives, like you can do things on a cellular level. There's stuff about microdosing. There's computer modeling. Like we have all of these alternatives. I talked to so many scientists and they're like, yeah, you know, they're not very good models. Most of these experiments seem so frivolous. They had a guy who talked about studies they do on dogs and they bred these dogs to have muscle wasting disease and then they try to treat the dogs. He was excited about this study because to him he thought well someday I'm going to be able to cure these boys that have this disease. What happens in those dogs is again not the same as what happened in humans and we haven't figured out why that genetic abnormality happens. They're incentivized to do it. On the podcast I'll hear that science talked about even though they always end by saying well this probably doesn't apply to humans. We just did this really cool experiment that makes it seem like it's somewhat relatable because we feel like there's nothing else we can do. I mean, do you see animal testing kind of being phased out at some point? So the NIH has stopped funding experiments on chimpanzees because a, they realized that they didn't really learn anything, and B, public isn't supporting us so much anymore. You know, you can still do experiments on these other animals, and, and the public usually gets horrified when they find out that dogs or cats are experimented on. The industry is pretty good about hiding that stuff. Do you, do you feel like that your two minutes, that your ability to talk to them is effective? I think that they, they have to be held accountable. That committee needs to be reminded that there's a lot of people that do not think animal experimentation is okay. I really hope that they listen. They have a lot of incidents where somebody forgot to feed an animal or give them water, and so they die of starvation or dehydration. They there's just some... forgot to feed them. In, in a room with mice, there's usually racks and racks and racks of mice. Unfortunately, the end result is usually they send them a letter of counsel. Are you going to keep going to these meetings? Yeah. So speaking of degenerative diseases and deciding not to have kids, no, that's not a transition at all. But that it made me think of, um, you were talking about the dogs and how they breed them like that. There was a guy I was reading about that's got this muscle wasting disease. And so he was like, I'm never going to have kids. That's obviously not the reason you've chosen <laughs> not to have kids. And I've, I've also chosen, you know, not to have kids. Have you always known? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like kids once they can walk and talk. To me, then, then they're more interesting because you can play with them and have a conversation. The idea that, that I would be, for 18 years at least, being wholly responsible for another human being, like, I can't do that. It's selfish either way, as they say. You know, it's selfish to have kids in a way because you just kind of want these little replicas. And I mean, not everybody, but I think that's a big part of it. And have somebody take care of you when you're old, whether you admit it or not, that's part of it. But then there's also the selfishness of just wanting your own time and not wanting to spend time at the park on the slides or whatever. And like, for me, I, people always think, oh, you don't like kids. But I was like, no, I love kids. I like to play. It's fun. And, you know, but only for like maybe an hour and then I leave. Life is so short. I don't want to spend my time that way doing those things. That's a big thing. Also, the environment and just kind of the impact of just bringing another human into the world. And also, the third thing is, like, if I were on a ship and somebody said, hey, should I join you on the ship? I'd be like, nah, it's not that great. Um, especially now <laughs> with the smoke and, you know, fires and who knows what's going on with climate change. It's funny. My mom said to me during one of our conversations this year, she said, you know, I'm really glad you didn't have kids. <laughs> wow. Because, yeah, because she's just like this. The world is destroying itself, and like my parents have always been supportive of my decision not to have kids. She, they're on Kauai, which is the, the smaller of the island, and they love the island. They get involved in volunteer activities. That's part of the reason that I'm in activism is because my parents were always involved in community stuff. We were actually on a camping trip, so we missed all of that horrible smoke. But our Alto, we we love it. We got in Canada because they only make them in Canada. It's like safari condo or something they're really lightweight we can tow it with the subaru because we didn't want to buy another car just it's pretty roomy inside especially with our pandemic because you can self-isolate more do you think that there's any hope for humanity to continue existing i mean i wish i could say 
yes, but I think we've continued down this path for so long. I don't think we, we value things just for being. I mean, there's some people that have gotten into, you know, trying to buy less, buy less plastic, but it's not enough of us. The plastics industry created the idea of the litter bug in the 40s or 50s. And so we as, you know, people became responsible for litter instead of them creating the product. That's the kind of the problem is observing everything as something to be consumed. Socialist societies tend to do better. They want to protect society as a whole and they care about their family and it's not just about their individual freedom. What do you think is going to happen with COVID? We're not going to get rid of it. We're just going to have to figure out how to manage it. But SARS and Ebola and all these other things that ultimately came from animals <laughs> are interacting with animals. What do you think is going to happen with the election? Ugh. <laughs> I don't think Trump, I think they're, they're going to have to pull him out of there kicking and screaming. What do you think is the most difficult thing about being alive? I think it's hard to see other people and other beings suffer. Or even just seeing a friend that's having a bad day, you know, and there's maybe you can't help them or you know, just all levels, you know, the really horrible suffering, but also just people that are not having a great time. How do you cope with sort of being exposed to so much misery or? I feel like if I can't, change the situation, then I'll hold on to what I can do. I was struck during the start of COVID when you were offering $25 vegan gift certificates to restaurants to anybody who needed them and they could message you privately and if they didn't have any money. I thought that was so kind. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we covered a lot. Welcome to Vinge Cafe. Okay. Lately, I've been using Just Egg uh, Deliciousness, which is made from beans. You like it? I love it. And I fried some for a lamen dish I made, which I'm calling that because it's just basically uh, lo mein noodles with a top ramen recipe. Or not top ramen, that's an actual <laughs> thing. <laughs> but anyway, ramen. Uh, you can see my background. It's all top ramen and cup of noodles in my childhood. We also had some of the delicious Steve's Smoky Salsa, which is, <laughs> well, my sister-in-law's husband and he is made a smoker and he's going to be selling it soon, I think. Sure. Next, we're gonna go into Rob's renovations. Hey everybody, uh, welcome to Roby's renovations. I'm your host, Rob. As you can see, if you look around, this place is a complete wreck. And a lot of it has to do with the last couple of years of me renovating other houses and bringing scrap lumber back. And I never really had a bench before. Where you see the red part used to be our picnic table in the backyard. Uh, Lenny wants a smaller table, so I wasn't going to throw this wood away, so I started building a bench. These drawers are from my last renova kitchen renovation where I didn't have to use them, so I kept the hardware and everything. This is just basic 2x4 construction, and that's where I am right now. Oh no. Part 2. Oh wow. What do you, wow, that's beautiful. That's for the tree? Yeah. Stacked all the tools and... Took some of my drinking jars. Yep, more jars to be had in the future. It's been my Sunday. It's usually my relaxing day, but someone wants me to have uh, this done by Monday. Do you have to miss your full-time job to do all this stuff? Yeah, I'm missing out on all kinds of work. I hope uh, that person appreciates it. Sounds like a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> Our next show, since it's a pre-Thanksgiving show, we're going to be sharing some recipes and Thanksgiving ideas mm -hmm. for the plant-based among us. It's exciting. Yeah. And thank you everyone for subscribing, for updates, for liking, for commenting. It really helps um, support our channel since we're pretty new. Sharing with friends if you think they'd be interested. If you have tips and you want to email me and say, hey, can you stop doing this or please do that, we might consider. We'll see. Oh, also, special shout out to mother in law, Rob's mom, Sue Ma, sent me these, all these necklaces. She makes necklaces. I got quite a few too. Thanks, Ma. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Bye.